Hello, welcome everyone to The World is a Mess and I Just Want to Steampunk It. This is Steampunk Star Raisin, your host, and I'm here with my co host guest, Daniel of uh, Daniel's Hot Topics and Daniel Star Trek, uh, Daniel Bertison, based in Ontario, Canada. And this is episode six of The World is a Mess and I Just Want to Steampunk It podcast. And it is September 11th episode episode six so how's it going daniel it's only about september 11th for about another 27 minutes here in la Mm -hmm. Uh, technically here in north hollywood but that's a neighborhood in la yeah yeah for me it's uh saturday september 12th 2020 right now uh 2 33 a.m eastern standard time so what's Uh, on your mind what's on your mind uh uh, i was i was just yeah um like this Star Trek day has been kind of cool. I've been I've been listening to a lot of um, uh, you know like Will Wheaton has been interviewing a lot of the Star Trek actors from TOS, TNG, DS9, okay, uh, Voyager, Enterprise. I mean, you know what? Actually, but for TOS, they only had like George Decay because William Shatner was not there. They why, didn't get why William was Shatner. Why was William Shatner not? Um, there for Star Trek Day. I'm not sure, but he would. I, I hear he's really pissed off on Twitter. Well, he probably wanted too much money. I mean, you know, it's uh, the word on the street. The wor- the gossip behind the scenes is that that's the reason why he wasn't in the 2009 Star Trek was Abrams offered him a cameo, and he turned it down because. He had to turn it down because William Shatner wanted fifty million. So I have a feeling it's about money. Usually, when William Shatner gets pissed at something, it's because he's too he he overvalues himself. He overplays his hand. You know, it's like playing a, a poker. He overplays his hand, and people call his bluff and see his shit. And uh, well, excuse me, I shouldn't use language because I'm trying to avoid this being becoming a, 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 an adult podcast. But he sees his crap. He, he calls his bluff, sees his crap, and, um, and you know, sometimes people will call him out on it, and uh, I have a feeling it's more about money. I mean, like, you know, William Shatner has been disingenuous in interviews where he, he's like, I don't know why I am not, you know, why William or why Leonard Nimoy hadn't talked to me in years, and blah, 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 and making up some excuse that he didn't go to his funeral because, well, we talked about this in the previous episode, but yeah, I have a feeling that uh, he's pissed because he probably wanted too much money to just to be involved with that. But who knows? Who knows? I mean, what's, what's the, why, why does William Shatner say he's pissed? I haven't really followed it. New Star Trek is kind of disillusioning. Because, yeah, he says he's pissed because he wanted. I think he he, he wanted to be a part of it. Like he, he's pissed he's not there. Yeah, but, but he probably wanted too much money. That's probably why he's not a part of it. Just like yeah. he wasn't a part of 2009 Star Trek with Leonard Nimoy, but he wanted too much money. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've dealt with actor types like that where they want to be paid to be interviewed. They want you to go through their agent, like it's some big to do, big deal. And I'm like, I just want to do a basic interview for YouTube. I'm not. I don't have money to pay you. Uh, can I just talk to you person to person and do an interview? That's what I usually mm-hmm. try to do. That's what I did with yeah. Michelle Nichols, and you know. But yeah, Felicia. I've interviewed. Uh, I haven't interviewed Felicia Day. I've met Felicia Day, but um, um, you know, I've interviewed uh, George Romero. Um, or actually, no. George Romero, I had an in-depth discussion. I can't really say I interviewed him, but Jillian Anderson. I interviewed J- Jillian Anderson, um, Nichelle Nichols, uh, to name a few. Um, I've, I got to ask William Shatner a couple of questions at um, one of his um, press conferences at uh, LA Comic-Con where he was promoting his graphic novel back in 2015. But... Anyway, so anything else you want to talk about in regards to Star Trek Day? Yeah. So, um, okay, so like the only person that was in um, in the TOS panel was. Uh oh, 
you're frozen. I can't hear you. You there? Hello, Daniel. Hey, Daniel, you cut out there. Repeat what you were saying. Oh, yeah. You're cutting out again. Okay, so um, back, um, what's this? Wow, we're having and, connectivity um, issues. Go ahead. Oh, hold on, hold on. Pearl Harbor hold will hold yeah. on, hold on, hold on. Wait 30 seconds because we're having connectivity issues. Let it buffer. Let's see if, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. All right, repeat everything you said because I didn't hear you. You, you, cut it, you froze. I couldn't hear you. Go ahead, repeat. Okay. Well, George Decay was talking about. Um, oh, darn it. Um, what's wrong? What's, what's wrong? What's going on? There's a there's something in here. I got I, I got to get it out. What, um, what's going on? What's going on? There's there's this thing flying around, you know, and it's a fly. Yeah, it's like a, it's big moth, man. It's just disgusting. Oh, anyways, it's, it's not gonna hurt you. It's anyways, good. um, it just wants to give you kisses. Okay, so he was talking about, you know, back in like, back in the day, he, uh, you know, back when the Pearl Harbor was attacked by, uh, by, the, by the Japanese. Yeah, what about all it? the All the Japanese in America were hurt, hurled, herded into concentration camps. Yeah, the Japanese, Amer Jap uh, Japanese American internment camps. I'm, I'm familiar with it. Yeah. So he was talking about how him and his family were hurled into those Japanese internment camps and, um, it was it, it was really bad like like the way you, you can't help but feel i mean it's really bad and really bad well, for him i agree that that was wrong and it should have never been done but the, unfortunately that is uh what happened and i know that the uh after world war ii ended they were released from the internment camps and then they later sued the federal government and i think a class action lawsuit and the federal government agreed to pay Twenty-five thousand dollars per survivor, uh, but it was like fifty years later. I think when they agreed to pay um, reparations for that. But yeah, you know, I mean, that was rough. That was not right. I I, I am familiar with George Decay. I've met him once. Uh, you know, he's always swamped when he goes to conventions. I met him once at Dragon Con. Uh, I think two thousand six, uh, and I gave him a copy of my movie, A Wondering Mind the God Machine, but. You know, I was hoping I would hear back from him, but I never did. I'm sure he has a million people giving him stuff at conventions. So, but yeah, uh, I don't have his autograph, but I have met him. He was uh, George Takei, very nice guy. You still there, Daniel? Yeah. yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Just got quiet yeah. and you had froze at one time. You oh, don't have any video. Just... You have no video feed. You're just audio only. But I, I mean, it might be for the yeah. best. It sounds like you're having connectivity issues with bandwidth so maybe you should just switch to audio only okay, go ahead what were you gonna say daniel okay uh like um yeah you know I, I just feel sorry for the guy the way he talks about it you know and it just it really sucks and um yeah like i, I heard like, he said something like his his family was given he was his family uh was given 25 dollars and a, a ticket to like somewhere else i'm not sure i think it was new york or something and and that's all he got that's all he got and i'm like wow that, that's just really really stupid and cold right well yeah and, uh, i mean back then during world war ii 25 dollars was more like i don't know inflation calculator let me look real quick not a lot of money either way and i, I never said it was right uh, but they, they did get compensated for it. Uh, yeah, it's, it's wrong. It should have never happened. Um, I'll say 1945. So this was after they were released. They were just given $25 and a ticket to New York. Yeah, or a ticket to anywhere they wanted. Uh Well, $25 in 1945 was the equivalent of $361. Yeah, I wouldn't have been able to start your life over, I doubt you. But back then, it was a lot easier to rent an apartment than it is today. Today, you got to go through credit checks. It's 
central credit bureaus that are based on uh, all your data is on the internet. Uh, they're less likely, you're less likely to meet the property owner. You're, you're dealing with middle management companies. It was a lot less so back then. Back then you could like shake hands with the, with the property owner. Uh, it was a lot easier to get your foot in the door somewhere uh, until you could make ends meet to pay your rent. You could rent a room somewhere. Uh, today it's much, much harder. Like even to rent a room, like in LA, it's like 800 a month. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm very fortunate that I got the place that I got. But yeah, um, I'm not saying it was right. Uh, it's not, of course, not right. But uh, it's not the worst thing that happened during World War II. But it doesn't mean that it's excusable and it should have never happened. But yeah, it was based in racism. But um, you still there, Daniel? Yeah, I'm here. I'm, I'm just listening. Anything else yeah. you want to talk about in regards to Star Trek Day? Also, you know what? He did, uh, George Takei, it seems like he likes Star Trek Discovery. He likes, like, that homosexual LGBTQ relationship between... I, I have no problem with a gay couple being in Star Trek. I have no problem with that. Yeah. The problem, I have, with in... the, the problem I have with Discovery is the characters are so freaking annoying. They are annoying as hell. Like that medical doctor who died, and he he comes back to life somehow, which makes no really no sense because it's all about spores, right? And yeah. spores bring him back to life, and he's just like an emo. He just I don't know. He does not have the demeanor of chief medical officer of, of a starship, and yeah, but uh, and the other guy who's like an engineer engineering lieutenant uh his boyfriend he he just comes off as callous and petty and uh i i just i just can't stand the characters the way they're written the way they're portrayed they're not that good they're just not that good uh the characters are annoying it's okay to have one or two annoying characters because you know you got you know you can't like everybody on this show but when like you you know you know uh um uh, you know, crewman Tyler used to be lieutenant, then he got demoted, then he got promoted to Section 31, and then Michael Burnham is annoying. Um, you know, the the Empress lady that's now in Section 31, she's annoying. There's too many, anno Michael Burnham, of course, the main character is annoying. So there's too many annoying characters, not enough likable characters, and it he focuses on Michael Burnham too much. So I, I really don't care if he likes the show. I, it sounds like he's just trying to maybe get back into Star Trek. Maybe he could have a cameo in Discovery. It can help get his career going. Uh, but, I, I mean, I respect people's opinion if they like that stuff. But it's just not Star Trek to me. It feels like just Game of Thrones in outer space. And... You know, Les Munez, when he put together the production team to create Star Trek Discovery, he said that he basically wanted Game of Thrones in outer space. And that's basically what they tried to do. And they've had to retcon things with the Klingons and kind of walk things back. And they had to back away from the Klingon war because it just wasn't getting views. They radically changed the show. They made it more, a little bit more like classic Star Trek with having bringing in Captain Pike. Uh, and the actor who plays Captain Pike is great, but, you know, and I like the character and I like the actor portraying him, but that's not enough to save the show. The show is just so annoying. Uh, I like the alien first officer. What's his name? Saru. Saru. I like Saru, and I like Captain Pike, and that's about the only two characters that I like. I don't like any of the other characters, and I, I just, unless they do a radical shift you know, why is it even called Discovery if, like, in season three, she's in the 31st century and the Federation is in decline? And why is she even, you know, she's no longer on the Discovery anymore? So I, I, I just, the show makes no sense and it irritates me. It makes me mad to no end as a Star Trek fan. I can't stand it. I will not watch it anymore. It's not for I me. Tried, I tried to watch it, but, you know, I just can't do it anymore. I'll watch the new stuff, but. I just, I couldn't it's, do it. I stopped like, like episode six through season two is where I stopped. I was like, okay, this is 
you know, the, the melodrama between Ensign Tyler and the Empress and Michael Byrne and that, that old angle is just flat. It's just really annoying. It's, it's just unbelievable that Starfleet would hire. Uh, okay. So he's got a Klingon in his bones, but Starfleet. Yeah. That's bad writing. Yeah. It would yeah. hire him. So he's like got a Klingon inside his bones and Starfleet still trusts him to be an intelligence, which makes absolutely no sense. Considering that he actually killed the chief medical officer, it makes no sense whatsoever. And then the, uh, you know, Michael Burnham getting promoted back to commander again makes absolutely no sense. Um, she started the war. The Klingons got millions of people click killed, got her captain killed. Uh, it absolutely makes no sense. And um, yeah, it's just the show is annoying. I, I, I just don't want to spend any more waste time with it. You know, I'd rather watch other stuff. Yeah. But, you know, I think it's going to get better because now they're in the future. And um, I like this yeah, future I mean, because it's a post apocalyptic yeah, but... future. And, you know, what I've always wanted in Star Trek. And uh, it's like way, it's like like 900 years in the future so it's uh, like I, I, in the I, year 30 what i doubt it's going to be good i really do Unless it's like in, do a radical well, shift. yeah it, it's like in the year 3188 so i'm like wow this is so far in the future and what we've always wanted so i think it'll be well, yeah because you know, it you, takes, know you, you you build up what? a pile of crap and you dive into that pile of crap and that's called the future of Star Trek Discovery. I mean, you can dive deep into, you know, a pile of horse manure. That doesn't make it interesting. It just makes it more mm. gross. Uh, <laughs> but that's what I think of Discovery. Can't stand it. Anything else about Star Trek Day that you okay, want also, to talk you know what, about? Um, what's his name? George Takei? He was talking about, like, LGBTQ stuff with Gene Roddenberry. He said he went to Gene Roddenberry's place. I think it was somewhere in the mountains or something. Mm. And he, he went swimming with him. And then he was talking about like, hey, you know, Gene, can you can you uh make LGBTQ stories? You know, because I think he wa his he wanted his character to be in a lesbian relationship because he was gay in real life, so he wants Sulu to be gay. Yeah. And uh you know, Gene Rodden according to him, Gene Roddenberry said like he, they're already pushing the envelope with the interracial kiss, you know, with the first interracial kiss. Well, he got a lot of flack for that, Gene Roddenberry, um, because in the '60s things were more conservative than they were today, and more homophobic and more racist than they were today. I mean, I guess you could argue racism has just been better hidden, and and Trump has brought racism back to the surface again. But as far as for television back then television executives were way more conservative they didn't want to show any gay people kissing let alone any kind of gay couples or relationship they didn't want to show any kind of interracial relationship so yeah gene roddenberry couldn't do the star trek he wanted to do until he got to next generation because by the time he had an opportunity to you know when he started forming uh you know a crew to uh, in 1986 he started pre-production for next generation and he, he formed a crew uh, a production team and he started casting actors and he was involved in the casting um he he finally got the notoriety that he deserved and he was allowed full creative control unlike he was in the, he only had full creative control in the first star trek movie star trek the motion picture but after that for as far as the movies they devoted him to just creative consultant and he resented that. And then the, but uh, Next Generation, he was really picky with the first three seasons. He was involved in production of the first three seasons. Um, he, uh, he was like, hey, this is, this is what I want out of Star Trek. This is my vision. I'm the writer. I'm the creator of Star Trek. And if you can't respect that, then you don't need to work with me. That was Gene Roddenberry's point of view. And I respect that. You know, yeah. because we need an opt optimistic, utopian view of the future. We need a blueprint for the future. Star Trek, to me, and I mean Gene Roddenberry's classic Star Trek, and that includes Next Generation. Star Trek, to me, 
is way more than entertainment. It is a blueprint for the future that if we get our act together, we can end poverty, famine, war. We can focus on exploration instead of the pursuit of wealth. I mean, it's so beautiful, that episode, The Neutral Zone, where uh, Picard says, hey, we're, we're we, you know, you have that, that cryogenically frozen guy who's like a Wall Street banker, and he's like, where's my stocks? Where's my bonds? And that episode was perfect because it, it showcased the difference between late 20th century and this also applies today, early 21st century. It, you know, it, 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 it showcases the difference between 20th century, 21st century Earth and 24th century Earth, how their cultural sen sensibilities have evolved. And you realize, God, we, we're just pay chasing this big, huge Ponzi screen scheme in the sky when it comes to trading stocks and Wall Street. And so many people are manipulating each other to rip each other off to get rich quick. And they're not building anything. They're not producing anything. And we're wasting 40% of our economy on financial services. Hopefully, we might be able to be ready for the retirement for the future that may never come. Because there's, you know, your future, your 401k may just disappear with the next stock market crash. You know, and I, I had a friend back in 2008. He lost, like, um, he had like five thousand dollars in his four hundred one k, and then it then he it dropped to fifteen hundred. But I'm frozen oh. for some reason. Anyway, I'll just keep going. This is a podcast. It's the video is kind of an afterthought. It's not always the point, but yeah, I mean, um, we need that utopian vision of the future. We need that utopian blueprint where. We have an economy that is a resource-based economy where you still have money like credits, like Federation credits, but that is not the driving force of the economy. The driving force of the economy is scientific exploration. That's the way society should be. That's the society that I want to live in. I do not want to live in the uber-capitalist society where, where everything is like the Ferengi. And I like the Ferengi because they show like what's the problem with contemporary capitalism, the greediness, the pettiness, you know, you know, and how that is underhanded with everything and it sabotages everything. And, you know, and so we, we need that vision of the future, you know, because we have enough darkness. I mean, this may be the anniversary of 9-11. It's like the 19th anniversary. It's not going to be a big deal until next year when it's the 20th anniversary. But it's, um, you know, this uh, coronavirus and the pandemic uh, has made 9-11 look like a tiny crisis in comparison. You know, because we're here in America, we're having 9-11 every three days, and we have a president who's just not really responding to anything other than his own reelection. And mm -hmm. so... Yeah, we need that. We're, there's too much darky dark in real life. I want a utopian vision of the future. I want something to, to that a blueprint, a path, a guideline for the future, something to hope for, something to feel good about. Like, hey, we, we may go through some crap that things might eventually get better. I like that vision of the future, and I think most people do. And I don't give a damn yeah. if people think that Star Trek needs to be darky dark. I disagree, and I think Gene Roddenberry, if he were still around, would disagree as well. Yeah, but you know, I think I think I like all kinds of tracks. You know, I think that you know they can there can be spinoffs for all kinds of tracks. If you want the the optimistic one, if you want the dark one, if you know, I think everyone should be respected, and I think everyone should get their Star Trek. But you know, it's all good. Um, what I like about Gene Roddenberry's track is, you know, what what I like about Gene Roddenberry's track is. I think he's original. What he wanted to do was there was no there was no currency. There was no money. Everything no, there was, was free. currency. It was called Federation but, credits. So, you, but 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 you didn't have to work for a living, right? Yeah, and that's the way it should be. That's the way it should be. Why should you force people, which is a form of slave labor, to work with something that where they're not appreciated? They're treated as disposable labor. Uh, and, you know, they have no financial security because they're getting paid so little. Uh, you, I guarantee you, if you had a society where you had a UBI, where, where even if you didn't work, you at least didn't starve to death and you got health care and you got retirement 
and you didn't live rich, but you, you survived. Um, most people would want to work because they would want more than just mere survival. But now, today, you have to work full time just to barely survive and have no money left over for retirement, no money left over for emergencies. That's not a future I want to live in. I, I want Gene Roddenberry's vision of the future. That's what I want. Yeah, but you know what? Some people say, like, well, with, without a little bit of slavery, society won't. No. Go. That's ridiculous, dude. Listen to yourself. Without a little bit of slavery, no. No, I know, but that's what people. That's what. That's what people tell me. I. I, I complain. This is slavery. You're forced to work. It's for wage a slavery. Uh, it's wage is- slavery. I mean, it'd be one thing if you actually paid people retirement that was decent. You paid people's medical benefits that had decent coverage. Um, you paid them enough that they could afford a car and a house, and they, and they could afford a four hundred dollar emergency. But that's not the way corporations think. Uh, that's hive mind groupthink, uh, corporatocracy, corporatism, whatever you want to call it. It's crap. It's not yeah, working for like- most of us. It's not working. Like sixty percent of Americans live in poverty now. But we're we got to wrap this up. It, it's been good talking to you, Daniel. It is, I got to keep this under thirty minutes until I can get a big enough audience. I only have All a right. handful of people that watch this and listen to this. So. Thank you, Daniel. This is Steampunk Star Raisin of The World is a Mess, and I just want to steampunk it. This is episode six for September 11th, 2020. You have a nice day, and I will see you 25 billion years. I will. Bye-bye.